Father, you heard every request in this room. And before we spoke them, you knew what they were. Yeah. But you did say, you did say, ask, yeah. seek, and knock. Yeah. And we heard various requests from sickness to a uh, need for commitment to you and whatever. We just now, now intercede for every request in this room. We ask you, God, to move in every situation and to work in every situation. We pray for those who need to be healed, for those who need to be restored, for these are waiting on appointments, for these guys just need more of you. We pray today, Lord, for this. We thank you for arranging the class change. We thank you for working in the hearts of the men in the fellowship hall to do this. Amen. And we ask you, God, to bless that class and bless all classes in this church Amen. as we study your word. We thank you for the rain that come. And we pray for more rain. We pray this morning for the service from the youth that you bless and anoint them. Yes. That we all be excited about what you're doing with the young people. Amen. And dear God, we thank you again for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Psalm 19 today. Trust not in chariots and horses. <laughs> If this was written today, you might have a different, a different title. Back in those days, they had chariots and horses. So God inspired the psalmist to mention that. Do not put your trust in chariots and horses. Our first part today is chapter 19, declaring the glory of God. Three things here. Number one, the general revelation that's worldwide when it comes to there is a God. I remember back in Vietnam, uh, 13,000 miles away, other countries, matter of fact, without the, without the uh, smog and corruption of our air, I remember the beautiful stars. Other countries, you see stars better than you can here in our own nation. Beautiful stars, beautiful stars. In a land of war, I recognized that God was still there in the creation. So we will see today our first part is a general revelation worldwide. And let's see how the psalmist writes this about the general revelation declaring the glory of God. The heavens declare, declare means show forth the glory of God. The heavens. And the firmament, that word is a vis visible arc of the sky. You can see that arc in the sky, you look around. It also showeth his handiwork. If we look at that, we'll see the work of God. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge from the glory of the God of the heavens and the firmament. Every day and every night it says the same thing about the glory of God. There is no speech nor language with their voice. What voice? Heavens and affirmment that is not heard. Doesn't matter what language people have, where they may be worldwide, the voice of the heavens and the affirmment is, is heard. Their line, again, there is heavens and affirmment. Their line has gone out through the, all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And them, again, that's heavens and affirmment, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. He put a sun in the tabernacle of the heavens and the firmament, which, now this is the word for sun, which, which is as a bridegroom cometh out of his chamber when the sun rises. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. So it's excited about the bride and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race because a strong man looks forward to a race. He'll probably win the race. He's described again the sun it comes out as a bridegroom. Verse six, his, again the sun, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit or rev revolution until the end ends of it. And there's nothing hid from the heat, that's the sun now, thereof. So these six verses verify from the word of God the general revelation of the glory of God worldwide. Now people can look at all of this Upon, based upon scripture, 
and they will all have to agree there's a God. Of course, the, those who don't believe in God won't do this. They'll say we have a, a giant explosion that brought us all this to pass. But the people that are searching for God, who are believing in God, these six verses tell us again uh, a general revelation worldwide that all these creations of God verify the handiwork of God. Maybe you have an experience in your life about some of this. Someone like to share something you might have an experience in your life about the nature of creation, son. It reminded me when I was in Afghanistan, you're talking about the, the light pollution that doesn't allow you to see the, the, the stars. I was standing in the middle of, of a field probably 100 miles from the nearest light source. And I had a satellite phone in my hand talking to Sheila from the middle of a field with the entire heavens above me. And I was so overwhelmed that night at how he could bring all this to pass and still let me stand there and talk to Sheila. It, it was just still overwhelming to think about. It's breathtaking, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In our busy lives today, people have, we miss so much, don't we? Yes. Just looking up at the blue skies, the birds, mm -hmm. yeah. the woods, flowers, butterflies, all of this, we miss so much. Don't you think, Brother Dean, that the first verse to me is certainly an explanation that everyone should believe in God. All you have to do is look around. Where do you think all of this came from? That, that man didn't make this. A special man made it. His name was God. And I mean, just there you can just see the power and the glory of the Lord. Just knowing what he has done for us and the beauty that he has presented each one of us to. We can get up every morning and I open up my back door and I just stand there and thank the Lord and praise him for the beauty. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's just really no excuse for man to say that they don't know about God. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to Brother Clinton, he was, when we were talking to him uh, coming here, one of the questions I asked him was about you know, his thoughts on the schools and how they teach a little bit of the Big Bang Theory, then they teach a little bit of the evolution theory or whatever and you know his thoughts on all that and he made a statement and it was very true he said if you give a man a little bit of science he'll say there is no god mm -hmm. if you give him a lot of science he'll, he'll say how can there not be a god mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. the second part is special revelation let's leave now what we can see and come down to a personal level verse 7 the law, the word the law means in here instructions of the Lord is perfect. Converted, and that means bringing the soul back to God. The law will do that. The testimony or the witness of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple or foolish. The statues, statues here means how he wants things done of the Lord. All right, rejoicing, rejoicing the heart. The commandment that is uh, any given order of the Lord is pure. Enlightening, enlightening here means having to learn to walk in light of God, of the eyes. The fear of the reverence of the Lord is clean. That word means clean, cleansing process. To have reverence for the Lord is a cleansing process. Endure forever. The judgments or the verdicts or sentence of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, to be desired are they that then go, yea, then much fine go. Sweeter also than honey are the are and the honeycomb. Honeycomb. Moreover, by them, we just read in verse seven down through verse nine, by, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is a great reward. So now you see a kind of a change in gears here from verse 7 to verse 11.
from the first six verses that come down to a special revelation that we have from the statutes of God, from God's commandments. By having a reverence for the Lord, we have a, we have a cleansing process that we reverence Him, we should reverence Him. And the judgments are the righteous sentences of God. We have now a special revelation, again, through all of this, about the glory of God. Not just what we see outside, but now based upon the law and the statutes, the reverence of God, we have now a special revelation. But now I want you to see number three, the impact of the revelation in verse 12. Who can understand, now the word he has been added in your Bible, it's in italics in King James Version, actually because read like this, who can understand errors? Cleanse thou me from thy, thy secret faults, or from thy secret. Keep, keep back thy servant also from presumptuousness, that word means pride and arrogant sins. Let them, let them not, not be have dominion over me, dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Now, the great transgression here means <coughs> rejection of Jesus Christ. Let me be innocent of that transgression to reject Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength. That word strength here is talking about my Christ and my Redeemer. He's the Redeemer. And Redeemer here is buying us back from bondage, and that's what Christ has done. So the third part is the impact of Revelation. Revelation from verse 6 verses about what we see, as we look around, we see the glory of God. The impact from verse 7 to 11 of special revelation we have from the law, the statutes of God. And now the impact of all of this is to bring us to the place we understand that there is a Redeemer, Christ is our strength, and let us always have words in our mouth and message our heart be acceptable in our sight, O oh Lord. So all of these, uh, chapter 19, again, is declaring the glory of God and the impact it has on us once we understand what we see, again, is what God has done. Not only through nature and heavens and all the sun and all that, but through his law and his statutes and all of this, we come to the same conclusion in verse 14. O oh Lord, my strength, my Christ, and my Redeemer. That's how you see it summed up in that way in the last verse. Anything else you want to add in chapter 19? Okay, second part is trusting in God. We have Psalm 20 now. This song to be sung as a people gathered in anticipation of battle. And they were singers in the Old Testament that played a part in the battles. Let's see now about this. First of all, what the people say going into battle in verse 1 through verse 5. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. <coughs> And the, the day, the name of the Lord of Jacob, defend thee. Now Jacob, throughout his life, is talking about that. The God of Jacob, throughout his life, defend thee. The God, and not, not, not Jacob now, but the God of Jacob, defend thee. As you go into a day of trouble, or you go into a battle. And for us today now, to bring it home to us today, you and I face the trouble in our life. The God of Jacob is the God we have today will defend us as he defended them. Then it says in verse number two, send thee, send thee help from the sanctuary. Now this is the point, this is point to the city of David. Send thee help from the city of David and strengthen thee out of Zion, or again the city of God, or Jerusalem. That's the, that's the place he's talking about. Send thee help, that's the headquarters of that time recognized as the headquarters of God, send thee help from this area. Matter of fact, when the children of Israel were in captivity, they were told to face the temple, to face Jerusalem. When they prayed, turn and face in that direction. And they just realized that they said, that's where our help coming from, is the city of Zion, the sanctuary. Now verse three, remember all thy offerings, and accept thy burnt offerings, Selah. Again, that's a pause for a moment. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation 
In the name of our God, we will set up our banners, proclaim the, proclaim the name of God. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. So these first five verses again is what the people say when they go into battle or into a day of trouble. Now look at the second part, how the king responded in verse six. Now know, now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven. When the saving strength of his right hand, that's a symbol of authority and strength. When the Bible says that Christ is seated on the right hand of God, he's not sitting there for the last 2,000 years doing nothing. It's talking about the authority and strength of God is Christ. At the right hand of God is his authority and strength. Same thing here. His right hand is a symbol of authority and strength. Then in verse 7, some trust in chariots. Now go into the day of trouble or to war. See, they had chariots and horses. But now the psalmist says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we remember the name of our Lord our God. In our battles, we're not, we're not trust in chariots and horses. We could put anything there today for our own, side, our own life. We could say automobiles and motorcycles. What do you want to use there? We face, in verse 1, we face the day of trouble. We won't put our trust in the material things of life. We will remember the name of the Lord our God. We go into trouble. In verse 8, they are brought down from fallen, but we are risen. They are brought down and fallen, the horses and chariots. They'll be brought down, but we are risen. Anything else we have in our battles now besides the Lord our God will be brought down, see and it says in verse 8 again, they are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright because we have put our trust in the day of trouble, like in verse 1, and name our Lord God of Jacob. Then verse 9, say, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. So these nine verses is talking about trusting in God. The entire congregation joined together to offer one last plea to God. That's in verse 9 again. Say, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. And that the Bible verifies you and I that the Lord does hear us when we call. The Bible teaches us he hears us when we call. So trust not in chariots and horses, but trust in the name of God, of Jacob. He will defend us. Any more you want to add now to Psalm 20? So Brother Dean, in that verse 7, um, but that they, they, they trust in uh, horses and, and carriages, chariots. How how would anti antichrist think that he could win a war against Jesus Christ with horses and chariots? And he will try to. He will. He will try to. I, I mean, some of his stuff is just really silly it's shenanigans. It's kind of stupid, isn't it? Yeah, it, it truly is. And then uh, what would God use? What would God use in the battle when he comes back? He just don't know. know. Sort of his mind. Yes. He's just speaking. Yeah, and we'll be with him, but we won't have to fight no mm -hmm. battle. It's like the arrest of Jesus outside the garden of Gethsemane. When he spoke, they all fell back to the dead people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't arrest him. He gave his own self up. That's right. And that's the God we have today. Brother Dean. Yes, sir. Uh, I think about, when it says, uh, trust not the chariot horses, I think about tractors and plows. You know, we can plow the ground, till the ground, plant the ground. But well, what do we have to have for it to come up? That's right. You gotta have God. Gotta, gotta have, have that road. Right. Is that a chart? You gotta have all of that. That's what Paul said. I have planted Paul's water, but God added the increase. Mm -hmm. In the spiritual way, you're talking about the dirt, which in reality, I know from farming that in our, my early years of life, you had to have you had to have the weather, man. Mm -hmm. Or you lose everything. Yeah. The last part is why have you why have you forsaken me? Now this is a, this is a wonderful chapter. You need to, we need to read it often. This is, is a picture of what Christ can do with the cross. 
It should make us more thankful for the sacrifice which paid the price of sin. The suffering shepherd, verse 1 through verse 6. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what he said on the cross, see. This was, this was inspired by David to pen this years before. But it's a prophecy point to what Christ was saying on the cross. That's what he said. Why art thou so far from hip of me? And from the words of my Lord. On the cross, this is what Christ said, and this is what Christ thought. He was all God and all man. So all man is thinking this. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. In the night season, and I am not silent. Now David, when he penned this, was speaking about himself and pointing to prophecy. You see that sometime in the Old Testament. You see it in a personal way. It related to things around them at that time. At the same time, it pointed to a prophecy be filled in the future. Verse 3, But thou art holy, O Lord, that inhabitest the praises of Israel. See, he inhabits the praises of Israel. He inhabits our praise today. God inhabits <coughs> our praise. We need to praise him. Verse number 4, Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou, and thou didst deliver them. Every single time he did. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But now, he said in verse 6, but I am a worm. This is a prophecy. Now David felt that way too in that class, but also it's a prophecy pointing to Christ. But I am a worm. Now I want you to hear the definition in Hebrew about this worm. It is spelled C-O-C-C-U-S, worm. C-O-C-C-U-S worm used by the Hebrews in dyeing all the curtains of the tabernacle red. That worm was used to dye all the curtains of the tabernacle red. Hmm. So Christ would say on the cross, but this is what he would think, but I'm a worm. He was made sin and you no know sin. And no man a reproach of men and spies of the people. That's what he went through. It's amazing to me that the word C O C C U S, this worm again, is what they use to make dye, to dye the curtains of the tabernacle red. And Christ here says, I am that worm. I can take your sins that are black as smut and use my red blood and make them white as snow. That's what Christ can do for us. So we see in verse 1 through verse 6, not only the thoughts that David had at that time as he faced his own enemies, but again the prophecy that pointed to Christ and what he said on the cross and what his thoughts were on the cross when he faced it. Back in verse 3, no, I'm in the wrong chapter. The second part here is the treatment of Christ on the cross described. Look in verse 7 and verse number 8. Brother Joe, go ahead and look up, please, Matthew 27, 36 for a moment. Lorraine, would you please look up Luke 23, 34 and hold it for a moment? Luke 23, 34. Let's go back now. The treatment of Christ on the cross described, verse 7. All that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lip. They shake their head. Everybody went by the cross, he said, is doing this. They shoot out their lip. They laugh me to scorn. Not only what he faced from Rome and the Jewish people, those who just passed by. Verse 8, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. See, and he delighted in him. And that's what one thing on the cross said. If you be Christ, then get us down from here. Let, let you be delivered and deliver us also. Matthew 27, 36. Brother Joe, you read that, please. Let me get back to it. Michelle had me confused. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting down, they watched him there. And sitting down... They watched him there. People sat down and watched him. 
I watched some old years, some westerns, you know, western movies, and they would have a hanging, everybody in town just showed up to watch the hanging. And that's the sling you had at the cross. People just sat down on that hill, on this hillside, they all just sat down and watched them. Yeah. And some come by, so they lift out, they reproached him, they despised him. Not only what he went through on the cross itself, but everything around him, you see. And all the disciples fled except for John and his mother stood out there in the distance. That was also very painful. Luke 23, 34. Miss Lorraine. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. The fourth statement on the cross of seven statements is what he meant. She just read it. Before he said, I'm thirst. Before he said anything else, he said, Father, forgive them. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing he said on the cross. Mm -hmm. For they know not what they do. Yes. He faced the cross. People seeing the tongue out and all this. He faced all this. First request he made, Father, forgive them. What did Stephen say when he was stoned? Lay not the sin of that charge. Mm -hmm. See? We have to face, we need to face opposition. We need to face our crisis of life and when it involves, and it involves people. Our first thing we should say is, Father, forgive them. Mm -hmm. I forgive them. And we have victory right there. Mm -hmm. Before we add anything else to it, to go into that scene with asking God for his forgiveness for these people. And they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They don't. And we don't sometimes either. Now, the third part. More details of the suffering, verse 12. Let's look at some more of this. Many bulls have been passed me, strong bulls of Bashan, have beset me round. They gallop upon me with their mouths as a raven and roaring lion. He's talking about the opposition. I, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. You see, you hunt. when they hunt someone across them the other day, when they, when they drop the cross into the whole, the whole body just shifted. Everything just shifted. And the process of dying began right then. He said, all my bones are out of joint. He could look down at his body, and everything he had was out of joint. <coughs> That's what he went through for me and you. Then it says this, uh, in verse 14, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels or my stomach. My strength is dried up like a pottery, a broken piece of pottery, so dry. My tongue cleaved to my jaws, and they tried to give him something to drink. He, was, he, wouldn't, take, he wouldn't take it. And thou hast brought me to the dust of the death. For dogs, here is the word means for Gentiles, have been past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell or count all my bones. Going back now to his bones. They look and stare upon me. He done this for me. He done this for you and the whole world. They parted my, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. They gamble for his garments. We need to read that almost every month, don't we? Mm -hmm. What he done for you and us, the whole world. But now, Brother Todd, but, here we go. Mm -hmm. The connection. But be not far from me, O Lord. O my strength has thee to help me. See, Christ still knew that. Liver my soul from the sword, my darling, my holy one from the power of the dog. But the Lord knew, Jesus knew, he would have help. He knew that he would have help because he was the darling, he was the Holy One of God, kept from the power of the dog. Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Now, unicorns here is an animal a size smaller than the elephant, which was a killer. He had one horn. 
It was a real animal. So here the psalmist brings it out, describes the opposition that he, he might have felt as David and also for Christ on the cross. Thou hast heard me from, thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns, from an animal a size smaller than an elephant, which was a killer. You have declared thy name, and you have delivered me. So we have now the last part, the victorious shepherd, verse 22. You that fear the Lord, praise him. If we fear the Lord, we have reverence for him, we should praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he that for he have not despised nor abhorred, the word means to test, the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. When he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee and the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied, and they shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kingdoms of the nations shall worship before thee. For the king of the Lord is, and he is the governor, that means to rule among the nations. That's what he'll do during the millennium. He'll rule upon all the nations. Verse number uh, 29, All they that be fat, that word means here rich, upon earth shall eat and worship. All that go down to the dust shall bow before him. In other words, those that die. And none can look, none, and none can keep alive his own soul. We all going to have to go leave this world. We can't keep it alive on this earth. A seed or a child shall serve him. It shall be accounted or declared to the Lord for, for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That he hath done this. Now the uh, born here that shall be born. <coughs> Worship of God is not for one generation alone. See, not only for the seed back in verse 30, but now in verse 31, they that shall come, a people that shall be born, also shall worship God. As they worship God back in those days, the psalmist today, you and I worshiping God now, and we were born, and we'll have more being born in the future, and they shall worship God. The victorious shepherd. Anything you want to add on Psalm 22? Anything you want to add in closing? Psalms is a wonderful study. It brings us so much information. We think about the hymn book that it was, but then prophecy was fulfilled, seeing how the heavens declare his handiwork it's a wonderful, wonderful book.